Oh my goodness. I'm excited. I can't wait to hear that. Hello and welcome to the Quackcast. This is Quackcast 537. I'm Ozone Ocean and with me is Bynes and Tart Serene. Hello. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Well, this week we're chatting about the idea of historicity and how it's, uh, you know, if you're doing a story sort of set in historical times, even if it's, you know, obviously it's fiction, but most of the time if it's, if it's like, um, if it's actually a historical story, like about a historical event, you shouldn't really mess with the historical period. You know, with as regards costume or um, setting or characters, historical characters, you shouldn't really mess with them too much because, you know, it, it's not down to, um, you haven't really got uh, a position to do that to mess up stuff that's really happened you know you should i put it better in the damn video we just did but the idea is that uh like do the best you can to make this like fit to make this fitting within the historical period where you're setting it so don't be a dick but there are a lot of exceptions to this which we will go over in the rest of the cast but first i've got to bring up the featured comic featured comic is a, a comic i featured this week because it's really good it's called patchwork and lace so i'm going to tell you about patchwork and lace now hello i'm ozone ocean and my feature for the week was patchwork and lace lilica and shiel are working as hunters of the supernatural. It's a tough and extremely dangerous job, but these two women bring their unique skills to bear on it. Lilica has the ability to summon horrific demons to do her bidding, while Sheol is a patchwork Frankenstein's monster of a woman who's supremely strong and has the power to regenerate. Together, they make a great team. The art here is all digital. It's all in black and white and grey. It's quite stylized and unique, actually, but very consistent and professional looking. You know, great, thick, hard, heavy line work. Like, really bold and confident. The story is action adventure fantasy with a bit of horror. It's uh, quite a lot in the vein of um, The Witcher. And the story itself is um, like a, a, a buddy kind of action uh, feel to it because the two girls are sort of, uh, the two women, I should say, are going on their adventures together and sort of working as a team. Lilica as the brains and Sheol as the muscle. She's a very powerful, strong person, like I said, who has the power to regenerate when she's injured. Although her clothes don't, so she has to take a constant uh, supply. But this isn't that kind of comic where the character gets strategically uh, derobed or anything like that. It's just more kind of uh, the realistic need for replacement clothes when she gets them ruined by being, you know, injured by demons and things. So that lends the character a bit of, um, you know, there's consequences to certain uh, thing, actions that the character takes, which is good. Anyway, uh, this is quite an enjoyable comic, um, and uh, it, there's two big long series at the moment, and they're sort of very different adventures. You know, we start on one adventure, and we sort of walk our way through it as one story, and then we go on to the second adventure. So it's very episodic in that way, and it's quite enjoyable. Uh, you should really like it. Okay, so have a read of Patrick and Lace. It's by... It's a Zeus, and it's rated T for teen. And that was Patchwork and Lace, a good little comic. Okay, so next up we have our featured music. Featured music this week is about a good little comic. Um, I really enjoy it. Uh, 
and you should see some of the latest art by the artist. Um, they've uh, done some experimenting, which you can see at the uh, the. What? <laughs> Bains, you have you got a clue here? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm getting a, a feeling that I'm getting a feeling that this is a comic that I know very well, <laughs> just from the way you're talking. That feeling might be correct. This week, Gun Wallace has given yeah. us a theme to Chatterbox. What? Starting off with uh, down home country bluegrass playing the mouth organ as you cruise around town on the back of your womp truck, <laughs> developing <laughs> into a rollicking, rolling, joyous, fun roadhouse concert complete with trumpets. Piano, bass guitar, lead, old star electric organs, the whole deal. Get up and dance to Chatterbox. Take it away, come on. Gunwallis' fantastic music to a comic by Baines, our very own Mr. Baines. So I hope you list, liked listening to that, and I hope you uh, take inspiration from the sound of that to go and see the comic that inspired it, which is always a Thank you, Gunwallis. So, very exciting. Yeah, Gunwallis has gifted us with another great tune to another great comic. Right, uh, his... Oh, oh sorry, Baines. No, me, I said awesome. That's all. <laughs> In Baines's voice. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, it's a Canadian thing. I wouldn't understand. <laughs> See, Tance is Canadian. You thought she was Greek, but she's actually Canadian. Well, she's Greek, <laughs> but she's also Canadian. So there you are. She's Greek. And Canadian, so, sort of. You're a mix. We um, Canadian. We Canadian. Exactly. Grenadian, which is a different thing again. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, hey, go on. <laughs> uh, this week we're talking about historicity and the the the. The trials and the tribulations and the troubles of mixing historical stuff. I suppose this is really a big problem when you're doing like a bio biography kind of story, when you're adapting that and you you really, really cannot compress characters together, like important characters in history. It's not a good idea to, to compress them. You know, people sort of get away with it, like with minor characters. Oh, this guy was the aide-de-camp to Napoleon, but he was... I've also sort of uh, added traits of this uh, mm -hmm. lieutenant and this uh, uh, major from these different stories, and they all became one person. You can kind of do yeah, that. Yeah, they'll often do that. 
they can have one actor playing a sort of voice of reason or the mm. sounding board or whatever, just for ease of like understanding what's going on. Um, I didn't even think about this aspect when you first brought up like historical accuracy. Um, but yeah, that's, it's an interesting one how they, and they, this is done all the time where they compress multiple characters into one character. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think of Malcolm X that springs to mind where Spike Lee's movie where he put where Spike Lee himself plays the best friend of Malcolm X. Oh, really? But he's like apparently three different people. <laughs> I think that's what it was. But like, you know, they just have him just, yeah. just shorty playing these <laughs> multiple. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you. And I know it's been done other times too. I've heard about it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's very frequently done. When a character doesn't have too much of a big historical impact, and therefore not a big impact on the story you're trying to tell then it's not so bad but um it can be really bad when it's um you know more important kind of uh kind of characters that mm -hmm. you shouldn't mix but um there's all sorts of examples of historicity uh, you know like messing with history when you get the um like costume design things like that messed up which a lot of people think it's just clothes you know whatever but hugely important to lots of aspects of history say if you're looking at um like paintings from a period you can tell people are totally different um mm -hmm. depending on what time period they come from i remember like just recently there was some fucking whoops i didn't say that that was pit fire. <laughs> there was some idiot sharing this meme about this uh, woman who was a famous pirate in the 16th century um Oh, the 15th century i think it was no 16th mm -hmm. so she was a famous pirate and basically she wasn't really a pirate so much as a privateer it was in the period where you know like queen elizabeth was say england was trying to control the the, the seas by like paying private individuals to go and like capture like french ships and spanish ships and loot their cargo and stuff like that so they were privateers and basically state-sponsored piracy and there was this particular woman who um you know her husband was killed in battle or something like this so what she did was she paid for a ship and a crew and um you know she had a bit of a, a pirate fleet or whatever a privateer fleet but uh, in, in this meme, she's pictured as being one of these standard kind of, um, you know, buxom wench kind of characters with a tricorn hat <laughs> and a shirt, you know, ripped in the middle, showing the bit of cleavage. What's and... that? What's the that? Side <laughs> for... yeah, that uh, tight bodice, for... a brace of yeah. pistols, and like, yeah, sure, if she was born like 300 bloody years later, maybe... But this, she said, no, this, that didn't exist. None of that existed. It's like the, the meme. This is wrong. All of this is wrong. You don't understand anything. Yeah, that's the, like, no. There's no freaking tricorn hats in Elizabethan times and buxom winch. You know, I mean, they did have a bit of cleavage, but it's a very different kind of thing. It's the big collars, you know. It's different. Freaking idiots. Yeah. The problem for me was they mistook pirates as in the classic 18th century pirates with the this you know the 16th century pirate uh, privateers which is a giving people completely the wrong idea of what p piracy was just because things are called pirates it doesn't mean they're the same it's like say mm -hmm. um you might depict uh chinese pirates as going ar and having tricorn hats and a <laughs> parrot on their shoulder but chinese pirates are completely different from that kind of image <laughs> just like um in a, in our sort of corner of the world uh the pirates that we had were aside from actual greeks pirating on other greeks that was a non-going hobby uh, but we also had uh, Saracens and 
um, lots of people that were of quite a diverse background from the Mediterranean in general, and they were all pirates, but they were like very specific. Their, their, their look was very specific and had nothing to do with the classic fantasy pirate. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, not. <laughs> well, there's the famous Barbary pirates who the Americans definitely didn't like. That was one of the first big uh, outings by the American Navy and American Marines, and the big successes yeah. burning their fleet to the ground. You know, going all the way after them. I think in the Mediterranean or something. I don't know the history of it, but uh, it's a big famous American um, early expeditionary thing. And uh, the Barbary pirates were, you know, what you're talking about, like Saracen kind of things. And they had that specific look and they were prolific slavers and generally nasty people. Well, I mean, when we're talking about history, everybody's nasty to everybody, really. <laughs> but they, they were... Well, pirates are pirates. Like, yeah. we have pirates currently. Like, in modern yes. day, we have pirates around the... Like around Somalia and yeah. the, uh, the around of the coast of Africa. Yeah. Uh, so we do have pirates and they are not, <laughs> uh, you know, swashbuckling heroes and anti heroes. And, and they don't definitely don't like frills as yeah. much as. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> There's also pirates in the. The uh the Southeast Asia as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so the the point the, of historicity is to stay as authentic as possible to an era. And the, when you are doing something historical, of course, if if you are doing fantasy or if you are doing your own thing, it's it's you know you do you. But if you are going for an actual specific era the biggest element in my opinion is not necessarily to stay completely true to historic historical facts in the sense that oh i'm going to absolutely uh, map out all the historical personalities that were around in particular time you know all of that but what you should do is to be as true to the ambience to the to the way to the way society was, to the way people thought, to the way people reacted to certain things, as as authentic as humanly possible. And I say humanly possible because history is basically an estimation of things. We cannot be totally certain of how things were, but we do have good indication and good probability to at least give a simulation that is close. Let's say that is close. Uh, as for us, you know, as far as we know, and, and based on the data uh, that we have and the evidence that we have. So that is, in my opinion, the most important element. You cannot put, for example, 21st century sensibilities and and problems like um, mm. motivations in a person that is in the 1950s or in a person that is in the 1850s or in the 1750s and so on. Be why? Because we, we arrived at the point of having the sensibility we have now because we have all the history behind us that we build on mm. as a society. The, the people that came before us are, in a sense, the shoulders we are standing on. So they would be looking at different elements of society than we are. They had different views because they had, they were standing on different shoulders, in a mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah, it's not a slight. Okay, it's it's just the thing where it, it's a it, different point in time with different fears for example. Yeah, quite often the, the problems they have are, like you're saying it's the earlier versions of some of the problems and the issues we've got. Ours are sort of 
yeah. more advanced, not in like better, but it, time has ad, ad, has advanced mechanically, and these things have evolved and changed, like you're saying. But they started yeah. somewhere, and that's where they started. Or they just exactly like for example, it's not that you cannot depict and make a feminist, for example, story in the 1600s, I think, or like the earlier on. But you have to be extremely careful on how you are going to portray a, an independent woman in a society that is not prepared to make room for this woman very easily. Uh, like, for example, the, the other day I saw this uh, extremely compelling and interesting story about um, this noble woman that became a nun in order to avoid being married and to continue studying um, because she was a scientist basically and uh, I, she was in Spain I unfortunately I don't remember her name um, and she was very much a feminist and she is considered one of the first pioneers of feminism as far back as like the I think the 15 or 1600s, I think, uh, in, in Spain. So you, you could do her story and the problems that she faced, absolutely. But you have to, to show the society that she was living in and, and how she became a product of that society. And she had, quote unquote, modern thought in, in the trajectories of that framework so yeah so she's you not cannot just... lead the movement when there was absolutely no movement at the time yeah for so that they're not just an alien who thinks completely differently from everybody else for no reason whatsoever it's like yeah i'm just like these ideas from the future have rocketed backwards in time into my brain and now i have uh... I've become this uh, prophet exactly. of the future, which is yeah how exactly. the stories are done. Another element is like if you take uh, like the very very much uh, referred to corset thing because we were talking about it before mm -hmm. uh, the cast. Um, so corsets are elevated in our society as a symbol of constriction of, of women and like a symbol of patriarchy and a symbol of the uh, stifling of women into a societal norm which is, uh, is not <laughs> it was simply uh, like an undergarment that was meant to offer stability pretty much like a bra in, in different ways and it was a product of its time in the sense that it provided the support necessary for women to wear what they were wearing and it was also something that was not uh, exclusive to women men also wore corsets <coughs> so that their uh, garments would fit on them like not all during all of the periods, but during a lot of the periods, and uh, it was not uncommon for men, especially very metrosexual men, <laughs> um, interested in their appearance, they would wear a corset that would slick down their form and you know all that sort of things. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that it appears constrictive to us now because we have no experience of wearing a corset like we have of wearing a bra or wearing high heels or you know wearing very tight pants for example <laughs> uh, well that's a good point yeah. i mean when you say especially how men wore it because one of the main things was you that you were sort of alluding to it was like yeah for support for um you know bust and stuff like that but it's also for shape and like you also said shaping people to 
have the shape of their body um, underneath their clothes and having the clothes kind of give them the shape they want, which was a very important thing. And it wasn't just like, so the, of course it wasn't like this myth, like of everyone's tight lacing and having to remove ribs, which nobody ever freaking did. That never happened. Um, so remember that they didn't know surgery as well. <laughs> they didn't yeah. have they yeah. didn't, like nobody would go under the knife in those eras unless they absolutely had to. There was no antibiotics didn't easy exist. Way. Yeah, to start. exactly. So uh, anesthesia did not exist yeah. either. There's so a... yeah, the thing was like shape. So it wasn't about like constriction. It was about the shape and the shape that was popular then as it has been for like of on and off all the time is to have skinny waist wide hips and a big bust yeah. and there's of course it's like facilitated different variations of that but also the outer clothes as well so you, people would have the gigantic uh skirts that would like branch off on either side with huge pannier bags inside like saddle bags for the ladies mm -hmm. to make the hips you know, really wide and padded. And, and, but the men yeah, as well. And the tiny waist, exactly, exactly. And the tiny waist often was more of an illusion yeah. because they had the cream, for example, or because they had three, four, five petticoats underneath, like a huge skirt. Yeah, it's a contrast. So, yeah, it, it, looked, mm -hmm. it looked narrower. But people tend to forget that uh, I think in the 1910s or in the 1900s, they did have corsets, but the corset was supposed to make the figure almost super oblong without any curves. I think it was like in the 1910s. 1920s. That is. That 1920s. Yeah. Yeah. So I was meant to have a, a waist in the night. Well, you were just like straight up and down yeah. 1920s and and i think that definitely like uh, towards the end of the first world war like around those years you had the corset still being a thing but it was not going to give you an hourglass shape it was going to make you <clears throat> oblong with very tapered down curves like hmm. very uh sort of hidden cares if you like boyish so the were popular then yes yes it is a, that it's something that completely breaks the stereotype of uh, corsetry like uh that, that's a, that's a thing that yeah. we don't really know as a society i mean yeah uh, what it, it was just a garment yeah that, that's all it was what i was further going to say was that like the outer clothes were again like exemplifying this not just the corsetry and for the men as well which is not often depicted like you were saying like sometimes corsetry which is especially a thing like in the early 19th century and the late 18th century yeah. but say in the early 18th century men had um like these padded frock coats with huge petticoats underneath at the waist that would flare it out and like almost um like a you know this like skirt a shape yeah mm -hmm. and of course you'd have the gigantic cuffs monstrous cuffs and huge wigs which you know yeah. they came from, really everywhere. <laughs> came from the 17th century originally but um yeah. that gave people a particular look that was totally artificial but mm -hmm. the clothes gave you a shape, just like the clothes for the women gave them a shape, just like clothes now. And one of the things I've noticed is that in a lot of modern movies and when people dress up in modern costume, they don't understand that about 17th century clothes or 18th century yeah. clothes, sorry. And so the men's coats, they make the, the shoulders look big, which is, you know, a popular look now for the men to have a wedge shape and mm -hmm. The, the skirt of the coat just sort of hangs, which in certain times in the 18th century, you know, it, it lost the, the padding and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. when you're depicting that early period, you have to have that. And it looks stupid if it's people, you know, just yeah. have the modern silhouette of like broad shoulders, narrow waist, narrow the rest mm -hmm. of the body. It's, that wasn't the thing then. 
if you see the excellent and, film um the draftman's contract by peter greenway it's beautiful and it actually shows the men taking off the coats and having the petticoats that are part of the waistcoat showing and that is a total like it's a, a fictional story set in the 18th century the early 18th century but they've got the costuming so perfect the only thing is they they do take certain liberties because the the men are all wearing white or they're all wearing mm. black there's those two things whereas in reality um back then men were wearing like bright pinks and greens and yellows and blues like uh, silks and all kinds of stuff but um peter greenway is someone who like like he's a, a painterly kind of person he has his, his visuals uh, have to look a certain way but the styles just amazingly correct and beautiful and it's something that you do not see in a lot of uh, historical fi films about those periods so you learn the problem and the problem with this is not that oh you are being pedantic like uh, it's just a story it's not that it's that in history just like today uh, one thing ties into the other and one thing gives yields something else so for example um, if you depict like something very simple all right uh, they couldn't they didn't have the capacity to change clo clothing as frequently as we do they did not have fast fashion clothes were an investment and so you cannot depict them wearing clothes the way we wear them the, what they would do was that they had basically it was everything was in pieces like sleeves were uh, detachable and waistcoats uh, bodices were detachable and they could mix and match and make different appearances and another thing is that they were underwear that protected their clothing from their daily like uh, body oils sweat and whatever mm. so they would have the other clothes worn, like the women did not ever wear a, a corset or a, or stays or bodies just right against the skin they had mm. a shift under them. they had like a sort of very light dress like situation going on which protected the bodies from being uh, from the corset or the stays from being uh, like a uh, dirty dump and they wouldn't need to actually um, wash it because it would stay clean they would wash almost every day the under garments that were their purpose for being there so that is something that is a some, sort of a small domino of things or another thing is that how did they keep clean well they covered up a lot for example they they wouldn't be able to wash their hair as we do now because soap had lye in it and it had a soap was not very much uh, available so how did they protect their hair they braided it and they covered it with hats and and scarves and scarves and stuff that's how like if you do that you will find because uh, I, I I do admit that I tried it and if you do braid your hair for a, like like continuously braid your hair and cover it with something it stays clean it does stay clean like I, I kept it for a week normally my hair needs washing every three or four days max um but I covered it like that and I created it and I covered it like that for a week uh, or 10 days and when I let it down it still smelled of shampoo shampoo so yeah sounded like shampoo sorry it's my bad accent but uh, yeah it, it, it smelled like it was just you know, very clean. Yeah. And, you know, washed. And it it wasn't 
greasy or anything like that. So the point what I'm trying to make is that if you have women with flowing hair everywhere, like it, it, it might make for a nice image to our eyes, but it will then need for you to explain how she keeps clean, mm. how her hair does not break up and stuff. So you might not care about these details, but it accrues, it, it, it adds up. And it's not just in these little things. Uh, if we went to, to other situations, they could affect your plot. Yeah. So. It's quite true, you know, little tiny things. I mean, it's like when you show like a, um, like you're doing a fantasy story. I mean, this is, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about history. But say mm-hmm. if you're doing, doing a fantasy story and you show, my God, this massive empire on top of this, like, really tall, um, like, a spire, this mountain. And that's where their, their huge empire is, just there. I think. Where do they get all their food? How, how do they get water? <laughs> like, they're on a, a rocky... <laughs> that must have a massive reservoir. But no, there's nothing... There's no huge farmland up there, like where, where what's the supply lines? They just magically exist, supporting this. Yeah. Huge, yeah. So there's those kind of. That's an example of, you know, your your ideas are freaking nonsense when you um, do this mm-hmm. kind of stuff because, you know, yeah, it's, and, and and it is a very much like a, people may not notice the work that you put in to make something authentic but the brain will it's it's uh, like in 3d rendering that people may not notice that you put for example uh, uh, dust on on a windowsill or you uh, make the drops from rain fall a certain way that is very natural looking but the brain will register that this this feels real. This feels yeah. like I can immerse. So that's what you get out of it as a creator if you are historically faithful. When you do a faith, when you do a historical fiction. Exactly. I, I well, I noticed that. Say when I was um, this is another kind of weird tangent take on this thing. Um, when I was making my hussar outfit you know um proper 19th century hussar and this is like a fantasy version of a hussar uniform in that it's not totally historically correct to a particular unit it's like a mix of a few but i decided to make it out of you know um mostly historical materials and you know put it together in the historical style and so it was you know, as, as correct as I could do it without being, you know, a total um, pedant or, you know, wanting to actually reenact a particular unit. And in doing so, you notice, you learn a lot of things about, um, the, you know, why people wore things the way they did and why this stuff actually worked and why they did it this way that you don't get when, you know, you just go and... Uh, like bodge it and just do like modern versions say the trousers for example are real military trousers they're from the 1960s but they're made in a style that was like continuously made since the the 19th century because these units just were you know historical clothes as part of their um their tradition and you notice Mm -hmm. like they're incredibly tight and they hug the body you know very very slimly and they um they sort of uh, exemplify the like uh, calf muscles and thigh muscles and stuff like that. Whereas modern trousers are sort of just blobby; they don't really fit in a nice way at all. They make your legs look like like crap. Um, jackets are quite short, whereas modern jackets will always hang past the waist. And there's a specific reason for jackets for being very short because that's where you you've got sword belts and all that kind of thing. And if it's too long, well. They kind of uh, yeah. mess around. There's um, what else? The buttons. Buttons are like metal, and in a hussar jacket, you've got like 
a whole heap of buttons, like like 60 buttons or something like that on your chest. Mass! Which makes it very heavy, which makes it hang, which makes it look a certain way, which you it's impossible to get from modern versions with plastic buttons. These kind mm-hmm. of things which you wouldn't ever notice or know about, but it, there's reasons for it being done. Anyway, sorry for that weird tangent. That's um. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's true. That, that's the point. That's the point of thing. And we are just like focusing on on garments, but that goes for populations. That goes for mainstream. I'm not talking like you can specifically have a person that is an exception ahead of their time or whatever but you have to show what the mainstream was and how the mainstream reacts to that ahead of time sort of way of thought Uh, so it's not that you cannot do your thing it's just that you have to uh, consider the type of waves that your thing would have made in that particular era and then that it then it will work because because it will feel real so yeah uh, yeah we'll say like there's this really great series um what was it called penny dreadful british series penny yeah. dreadful i think there's a new version now set in america but the original was set in 19th century, late 19th century London, Timothy Dalton was in it, got involved mm-hmm. unfortunately. There's a lot, lot of, lot of great actors are in it, uh, and it was, uh, it was pretty cool. It was like based on the whole, um, you know, like the universal horror kind of, kind of characters in there. And we have, um, uh, Frankenstein's monster and, uh, <laughs> Dorian Gray is, is a character in there. And of course, it's it's a historical. It's not you know fully historical, but it's it was really set well within a historical matrix. You know, like the Timothy Dalton character had a um had an African servant, and they made sure to make that uh like properly fit in because like he met this guy when he was being an adventurer in Africa and you know they had like a moment together and the guy came across to be his um you know to work for him and there's a specific reason for these kind of things and it was set up really well Eva Green's character who was this woman who like had some she's possessed by Satan at times or becomes a witch or something was like realistically set in this world and she has all the social pressures on her you'd imagine that a woman had um, and it was really well done. They had set it really well, but unfortunately, towards the end of the series, they lost money, and obviously, they knew they weren't going to get renewed. So they compressed everything down. They introduced this other character, who was this woman who um, was uh, like dressed completely ahistorically, wearing trousers whenever she wanted to do kung fu fighting and all this stuff. And it was, and you think, well, they went to such effort to make these characters fit in and you know to get unusual characters and to still make them fit in the historical matrix that they wanted them to be and then you've got this stupid character who like trumps or stomps all yeah. over everything Why? especially considering like how wearing pants having females wear pants was such a, a social struggle so just, it is a little bit like sitting in the face of all those women that actually fought and got. Well, that. especially it like spits in the yeah. face of the other characters you have in the story who have been struggling yeah. to make themselves justified in a sort of stuff when these characters goes, no, I don't give yeah. us flying stuff about any of your mm-hmm. setting or your backstory. It doesn't matter to me. I can just do what I want. <laughs> So I'm yeah. Chachi. She was the Chachi <laughs> from uh, Happy Days. I think kind of similar in Happy Days, where they were in their early seasons, pretty dedicated to having 1950s. The show was made in the 70s, but dedicated to having 50s-looking cars, haircuts, clothes, and attitudes. 
I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, until whatever season it was that, you know, they wanted to goose the ratings and like shake things up and bring in a younger character. And Fonzie's young cousin, Chachi, comes in with like a 70s haircut or early 80s probably by then. And like this very much like 80s kind of 70s, 80s kind of fashion. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, and everything started like after that, all the haircuts started getting looking like eighties poofy haircuts, and it all kind of just went completely off the rails. <laughs> it was a comedy more. show, but I think it did contribute to the ruination of like it. It did take away yeah. from the experience of that show. Mm-hmm. I, I would imagine. What was yeah exactly that? That's just and flagrant anachronism in there yeah and it and the point is it's it's not bad to have an anachronism in a thing but it, these are stories that are set up not to have anachronisms and these are mm-hmm. anachronisms that are forced into it and they mess it up because yeah. it's not structured in a way that allows anachronisms to be part of it so mm-hmm. yeah that's that's an excellent example didn't they have uh, like Mork and Mindy in there being just totally completely 80s. I'm pretty sure they started out in Happy yeah, Days. Yeah, Mork first showed up in Happy Days and he was so inaccurate to the alien spaceman of the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they should have been like, green with little antennas. That's the 1950s <laughs> aliens. We are modern people, products of our own time. And we have biases and stuff. There's no way that there there will not be anachronisms in a historical piece that we create. It's like the like the, like when you are a researcher, you will go in with some biases. The point is that you try to limit those biases as much as you can, and that's the same thing with creating a historical piece. You will have an anachronism. There is something that that's unavoidable. The point is to make them as invisible as possible. Like even Homer mm-hmm. has anachronisms in the Iliad. Uh, you know, they, he has tech in the Iliad that wouldn't exist in the Mancinian time when it is set. Yes, oh. not many people wearing yeah. full uh, body armor made of uh, metal and stuff like that. It was like boar tusk yeah. kind of armor and things like that. Exactly. Kill so he has other images that reflect his own time, and that's fine. But the thing is that he has made a conscientious effort and considering that it's something that he would recite by heart, <laughs> um, or at least w- was recited by heart, and you know, relayed over generations. Uh, before he wrote it down, you know, depending on what to go with. Um, well, that's an interesting. So he, he, he made the just I'll complete this. Yeah. He made the conscientious effort to at least be as authentic as possible to the original material, and we know that because he was pretty authentic in other aspects. Like he has a few anachronisms in a humongous saga. Mm-hmm. That's it. Very, very long saga, and we, we don't have all the parts of it either, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. We don't have all the, the parts of the full story. But, um, yeah, that uh, reminds me of a thing. So uh, he has anachronisms because this is told for a contemporary audience of, you know, the Greek people at the time, about an earlier time. And we have that in, like, biblical tales as well. And, say... If we took, if you think about um, Renaissance um, paintings of, yeah. I don't know, the crucifixion or um, famous uh, biblical tales, so you'll see angels dressed up in fifteenth uh, century plate armor, and <laughs> Romans yeah. dressed up in the same kind of way, you know, and um, or. Uh, Mm-hmm. So you have flagrant anachronisms because they're not uh, like uh, these people are doing this for a modern audience of their time. And 
so they're they're treating this story as I don't know more like a, like a parable. Inspiration. And uh, I don't think that those like those artists were seeking to be historically accurate. No, no, no it's just not. That they were seeking to simply depict part like a scene of a story, and that was it. Like they they weren't interested in being historically accurate. Well, they wouldn't have known for a start. But and the mm -hmm. the other thing is they're showing okay so these people are meant to be like um like say Michael the archangel, he's meant to be like a warlike kind of figure. So we paint him being what we know or what the people will know of as being a warlike person, which is a knight in full armor with you know a fifteenth century okay. um, arming sword, even though you know that's a very anachronistic but that is told for an audience in a way and i'm thinking that is more like say something like um uh, sorry what was that modern like musical um hamilton hamilton yeah so this is told for an audience you know like a modern audience and if we're not telling like a strictly historical story here we're sort of just trying to convey an idea more than anything else so you, you deliberately cast it with african-american people and it's to tell a story in a particular way and to convey particular meaning so yeah. in that respect you're not being you don't have to be exactly historically correct in this because mm -hmm. you're it's more important to convey the idea and the you know the philosophy and the feelings rather than educate people yeah absolutely uh, that brings another element to the discussion is the, what are you seeking to do with the story and and are you are you uh, honest about that in the sense that if you really want to depict the historical era you have to be faithful as we said if you are interested in just taking a particular story and and focusing on something else you can get away with more things. Like, for example, uh, take Greek tragedies. So we have a lot of um, Greek tragedies that are being played today still. And they are very faithful. Like, they, you know, the, the, the actual, not the script, the, the play, like the, the the play, <laughs> the actual play, is being followed. However, the costuming often is very modern, or it is very abstracted, it does not correspond to any era, or it is it is coding for certain things because every director of the of the play that is being um, oh my god, I don't have vocabulary right now. Every play every play that is being made, I guess, uh, they have a vision of what they want to, to show. Like for example, there was uh, around the time my mom was a teenager, there was this uh, very famous uh, uh, director of, uh, of uh, stage plays. When he uh, made I think it was Trojan women or or Antigone, one of those um, of those plays, and everyone was dressed in, like the, the 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 guard of Creon or anyway the Greeks were dressed like military junta soldiers and. The Trojan women, I think, or, or Antigone, I just don't remember which play it was, uh, was dressed as a normal civilian. So that was a message intended for the particular time period, which was like the military junta of the 60s, and basically sidestepping side -stepping, uh, censorship, censorship because yeah. it was a classical. A Greek play, but the way that the, the artistic choices made it, made in in that in that play were a lot more significant than the play itself in the particular time. 
So if you are going for something like that, then that has to be very apparent. Mm. That's yeah, exactly. That's a good point. I think there was a Richard the Third. That was, um, I think, it was Richard the Third, the Shakespeare play, and that was. Mm-hmm. They did a version of that with um, sort of uh, set in during the Second World War with characters being very oh. fascist and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like you you change the setting, you costume people in a certain way and it really exemplifies like the meaning of the play better yeah. to a modern audience than it would if you dressed everybody in you know the style of mm-hmm. the 1300s or wherever that you know time period yeah. the, the original uh, uh, for example, uh, let's take to the same play uh, brought to the screen by two different uh, directors like Jeff Pirellis and Romeo and Juliet and Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio and I forget who made that um, Baz Luhrmann who? Uh, Baz Luhrmann, as an Australian okay. director, who yeah. did um, various things. You know, yeah. the, so, Zeffirelli Jeff 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 created a highly historical time period piece with uh, Romeo and Juliet. They were set at the time they were supposed to be. They were dressed authentic, authentically. Uh, they had, like, everything was super authentic. Everything and every frame is a painting, as if like from the old masters. It's it's a beautiful film. It's super historical, uh, very very faithful to all kinds of details. The the music uh, is not completely historical, but it has certain parts where it is. Uh, so you you know you get the measure. Whereas Romeo plus Juliet. That is is completely not a historical film. It is basically a turf war between mob mafia families, and it is focusing on completely different things. And, and it is again a very beautiful film. I I really like it, just as I like it. Really. With modern music too. Mm-hmm. Very modern, super modern music, yeah. and you have diversity like a. I don't remember. I think Mercutio is uh, mm. is black, and and sort of uh, uh, like a drag queen. And I love his piece where he sings and he's in the party. And it's awesome. Um, but if you had a black Mercutio in Jeffrey Ellis film, that would completely ruin the ambience. That would completely ruin that particular film. So that's the point I would be trying to make. Like, if you go for historicity, be faithful to that. If you don't, don't try to pretend you are. That's, mm, that's a good point. Yeah. And I think around the same, exactly the same time, we had uh, Tromeo and Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that now, have you? <laughs> oh, you, you do, you do, you will in. Maybe enjoy it to be traumatized by it. I don't know. It's a, it's a very different. Um... That was right around the same time, wasn't it? There was a little trend there. It was deliberate. Hmm. Wanted to cash in a on little, the, Yeah, uh, a little the trend. Oh, okay. That's what it was, yeah. Which, uh, yeah. of course, directed by the famous, um, uh, oh, God, I forget his name. Um, Roger Corman? No, a Tromeo, um, d- created by. Lloyd Kaufman, that's it, the famous Lloyd yeah. Kaufman, who I've met in person, and he was a oh, did you really? an amazing oh. man. Yeah, he's a character. Yeah, oh, I didn't know you met him. Yeah, just cool. an awesome guy. So, um, cool. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that is Tromeo and Juliet is um, a very, very different depiction, and not very faithful to the play. <laughs> <laughs> but not pretending yeah, so, to be historical either. That's the thing is that you have to be sincere in what in what you are creating. Uh, 
And uh, if you do go for historical accuracy, and if you do go for historicity, you cannot break that because it will stand out like a short hand. You can do the exception in history, you can do that, but in order to get away with that, everything else has to be absolutely super historical. And then you can insert your non-historical element and people will buy it because mm. things happen. I mean, uh, like you did have outliers throughout history for everything, but you mm. have to convince that everything else is true to, to the subject matter and then insert your outlier and treat it as an outlier, that's the point, mm. that this is an outlier. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, put it into context for people. There's a, another aspect of uh, his historicity that we don't. Um, it is more coming to the fore now is the fact that a lot of history is uh, so-called whitewashed. In that, um, say, we are we've sort of been convinced that uh, history is a lot more homogeneous than it was. Like say, nineteenth century um, Britain when we you know we see a lot of historical dramas and everyone there is you know like uh like white indigenous like british yeah. people whereas you know the reality was that it was uh, quite a bit more mixed than we've been led to believe like especially in coastal towns and like cosmopolitan cities like london where you had a, l a lot more you know people from different parts of the world like in, in a big yeah, city like that. In Commonwealth, where it had a lot of people circulating. I think the point, though, is that how how this is depicted again, because it wasn't like London is today, yeah. where you have a huge level of diversity and the way that people are treated is super equal. So they would have probably, like my estimation is that they would have some diversity, but this diversity wouldn't be treated as it would have been today. Hmm. So in Penny That's Dreadful, it, it's a very, it's a more faithful depiction of that. You do have mm -hmm. like, um, you know, the Chinese quarter and, you know, African people and that kind of thing, but it is a more realistic kind of version of that saying, yeah, there's a classism and there was, you know, racism and all this kind of stuff. So that, that, that's another thing is, is that people forget that there was stratification and, and it was extremely evident in everything. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that one thing I appreciated about Pride and Prejudice, like this mini series of the BBC was that when they, they they have this sort of insertion where they show uh, Darcy going into the city parts of London to find where Lydia had eloped with the, the guy, Mr. Wickham, I think. Um, so immediately, it's we are we get whiplash in how different it is because it is a completely different social class where he goes. And he sticks out. <laughs> he super sticks out, out of everyone around there. And that I really appreciated because that was the point of the, the, the clothes of the time, the access people had to it. You had extreme differences in, in social class. And people tend to forget it. Like they, they tend to depict a sort of mishmash of people that sort of look the same and you cannot really tell who belongs where mm. unless they are wearing, I don't know, made, freely made <laughs> apps or something like that. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, you have to to remember to, to go and look at how those societies were structured and how they worked and you know all of that. Well, like on slightly slightly again, you know, another slight diversion. Um 
military kind of stuff. So this is something like I've researched a lot of because I'm interested in. Um, in the say the 19th century and before, uh, when people are depicting um, or looking at kind of military stuff now, we see people dressed in all these amazing different colors, you know, uh, like in huge feather headdresses and bright red coats. And then we see them standing in lines like and we think oh my god they're just waiting to die you know they've got bright colors on they're easy to shoot they're like uh, that makes them like very visible from a distance and they're all lined up so they're much more easy to shoot and people don't understand that there's very specific reasons why people did that in the past because guns weren't accurate at all in any any kind of way at all they didn't have rifles like until like, quite a bit later um Mm -hmm. You needed brightly colored uniforms so the people in charge could coordinate where people went. You needed musicians on the the field of war, not because, you know, like they, you know, they didn't care about being shot or targeted. It's because you couldn't target them from a distance. They needed them to coordinate complicated battle maneuvers. Like This was a completely different world to what we have now. And especially, I think, when Americans depict, um, like, uh, the Revolutionary War, they've got this fantasy of, oh, sharpshooters and our oh, guys were better because we could, like, hide in the bushes and shoot and shoot those brightly coated, uh, you know, red coats and stuff like that. No, that was not really quite what was happening there. You, you can't think about this stuff in terms of, you know, modern warfare where people wear camouflage in order to disguise themselves. So yeah. It's a completely different and matrix. It, the technology was different. Yeah. And, yeah, you cannot understand it in a modern context. So there's things like that. Exactly. Anyway, so exactly. Uh, and also culture. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, talk about something that is fairly recent and still would be relevant in Greece of today. But in Greece of just uh, just after the war, like 50s, 60s, it was something very significant. Um, so at those decades, we had a king that was not very loved, <laughs> but that's beside the point right now. So we had a king and the king was very much Europe, in the sense that it, it, he was very cosmo his family was generally very cosmopolitan. They came from different parts of the world that had different uh, scripts and stuff than uh, Greek people. And they didn't really have much of a connection to the uh, middle class, low middle class Greeks um, at all. So for example, and this is something that often brought friction on a cultural level as well, aside the political stuff. So uh, the king dies at some point, and they have to bury him. And there is this huge funeral and everything. And the queen is the super grieved person. She survived him. She was also not very loved, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so she is where the, the traditional Greek way of mourning, a woman mourning, is that she wears all black and she wears nothing else, like no jewelry, no makeup, no fixing of your hair. I mean, okay, you don't have it like in front of you, but I mean that you don't really quaff your hair or anything, because the point is to show that you are too sorrowful for these things. So this is the script. And you're supposed to do that for uh, at least uh, nine months, and then you can quaff your hair, but that's it. And then you have two years, and then you, you can wear some jewelry. And then you have five years, and you can dilute the black. That's the traditional way, guys, OK? It's not mm -hmm. what happens now. Uh, so the queen was wearing all black, but she also was wearing pearl earrings and a pearl necklace. So that was super castigated 
by everyone in Greek society. Then she couldn't understand why, <laughs> because she was clashing with the culture. And, and she was perceived as basically wearing a red dress to, to the funeral, which was a very big faux pas, of course. So uh, it wasn't an issue of whether she loved the king or not. It's like, what the hell is she doing? <coughs> wearing jewelry yeah. and stuff. And, 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 for, and that further alienated her from society. So if you take this element, if you know of this element, and you take it into a story, you can either use it and have a person cause a ruckus, a social ruckus, because they are wearing jewelry or something like that, or if you know that this person wouldn't do that, you know not to depict them in jewelry while mourning, and so on and so forth. So, well, and another, story, you know? another aspect of that is, say, when people look back at history and they see a figure like that, and they'll say the pearl earrings, and they go, yeah, so this is a woman of style wearing the pearl earrings, so I'm going to make my character do that as well and all these characters without actually realizing that this was the odd one out it was not typical yeah. it's noted not because that was how things were but because it was unusual and it's very stupid and to negatively, negatively unusual as well it's, it's not like oh wow she's doing something cool we're gonna do that <laughs> Which was what usually happened with queens. Queens wore something and then the, the fashion got on. But, but not in that case. In that case, she was completely, like, she was cast, castigated until the very end for that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's an important part. Often people take an unusual thing and consider that the norm. Whereas in reality, it's only noted because of its exceptionality. That's a very important fact to remember. Like, say, Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was mm -hmm. a particularly amazing, interesting historical figure. And she didn't have a whole lot of other people doing that. She is historical and amazing and incredible because she is singular and very exactly. notable for being that so yeah it's important to remember that particular facet well i think we should sort of wrap up unless bain do you have a no wonderful <laughs> <laughs> i'll just i keep thinking what will future quote-unquote historical mm. fictions look like well, all Americans will be wearing yeah. cowboy hats. You'll and, uh, see, like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, when you, you mentioned the pilots very early on, about a 300-year gap between some of the specifics yeah. of how they're portrayed, it's crazy to think. Oh. You know, like Martin Luther King will be like on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Hitler was on Twitter. <laughs> Absolutely, and everyone will... Like it depends on on what uh, source material they have. Like, if they have that um, uh, a source material like uh, Back to the Future, uh, <laughs> the authors will be completely different. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That'll be your base. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that I mean, all this true. stuff becomes. I guess that's the it, right? Like all this stuff becomes the historical record, and it's mm -hmm. so crazily inaccurate in some cases that. Uh, true. Well, people. Yeah. I mean, unless you really dig in and research, yeah, you're going to be completely wrong. Well, that's happened with Arthurian fiction already, because uh, sure. Arthurian fiction is mostly fiction, and people look back and they say, "Yeah, well, you know, King Arthur actually lived here." There's the round, the the the, the round table was uh, in Sol Salisbury, and and all this stuff, and that's uh, you know, that's where he sort of yeah. defeated Mordred and um, there's the lake <laughs> where the lady in the lake gave him the, the second Excalibur um, yeah so this is this is real history whereas it's really not 
And, um, yeah, just like uh, a lot of uh, the plays that uh, Shakespeare wrote uh, that were historical fiction are taken as historical fact. Right. Uh, which is a big issue. It too, Brucey. <laughs> yeah. Remember the Ides of March. All that stuff. <laughs> well, he was a pop. This is of the very few things I know about anything. Shakespeare was like a pop artist, right? He was like a Steven Spielberg oh, the time, of the yeah. 80s kind of guy, sort of, right? Like he was an entertainer, yep. a pop entertainer stuff. So, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, it's crazy to think about. Like this stuff is not period accurate mm -hmm. necessarily at all. Especially, yeah, with the, the big speeches and stuff like that. Oh, my God. Did... Friends, Romans, <laughs> countrymen, lend me your ears. Oh, it wasn't Julius Caesar. Such an amazing orator to come up with lines like that. <laughs> that we remember now, but yeah, it's just uh, lines in a play that uh, that Shakespeare wrote. So, hmm. It's a good point, Baines. Well, it's wild, man. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, history does get compressed, oh, right. unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, all right, all right, all right. We should uh, wrap it up then. That's uh, yeah. That's Crackcast number five hundred and thirty-seven. I've been Ozan Ocean, and you've been yourselves. Wonderful, wonderful. Mary, yes. <laughs> Mary, Queen of Tants, and Lord Fames <laughs> of the Seven Kingdoms. In ancient China. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Bye bye people. now. Bye bye. Now. Bye bye.